Amen. Well, it is good to be here tonight. Take your Bibles and I'll be finding 1 Peter chapter number 2 tonight. 1 Peter chapter number 2. And we'll see what we can find here in the Word tonight. 1 Peter chapter number 2. And I'm going to read. Uh, I'm going to read this entire section. We're working our way through, just so we can get a context of what is being said here. And uh, I, I take these sections um, uh, that may have you know ten or so verses in them, and then uh, that section has a certain theme to it. So we'll preach all through those verses uh, on a certain theme, but we'll only cover one or two verses at a time. So uh, to begin with tonight, I want us to look in verse number 13 of 1 Peter chapter number 2, and uh, I'm going to read several verses here, and uh, just so we can get the context of what's going on or what's being said in Scripture here. And, um, and so in verse number 13, the Bible says... And by the way, this, this entire section of chapter 2 is, is really having to do with submission to rulers. And, of course, that's what we've been looking at. We started last week and looked uh, in verse 13, uh, verse 13 through 16 last week, and we're going to move on this week. But look in verse number 13. It says, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that... With well-doing, ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. For this is... For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully, for what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults ye shall take it patiently, but if when ye do well and suffer for it ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto ye were, were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Now, if you caught that, Peter here is preaching out of the book of Isaiah. Anyways, uh, I, I love it when we see things like that in Scripture, but... Um, but this whole section right here has to do with submitting or submission to rulers. And, and this, is, this is talking about um, how God wants us to act as Christians in the world. And uh, we're working our way through this section of Scripture, which uh, really what you could say is, is it's showing us as Christians we are to have a friendly pursuit. We are to be kind, even in difficult situations. And uh, the theme of this series and the book of First Peter as an entirety is how to respond when walking through the fire, when your faith is being tested, when things are not going your way, when things, uh, when you are being persecuted for doing something good, uh, how are you to act? And uh, Proverbs chapter 16 verse 9 says, a man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. And the only way we can expect to do the right thing in life is if we are first allowing the Lord to direct our steps and we receive that direction how through his word. And uh, that's why so many people are living contrary to the word of God. They don't know what the word of God says. And uh, we have to study the word of God. We need to study the scriptures. We need to know the scriptures. Why should we know the scriptures? Well, as the psalmist said, uh, so that we might not sin against God. Uh, he, he said, uh, I mean, uh, it, it's, it's important for us to memorize scripture. He says, thy word 
have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. Uh, and so if you don't know the Bible, then you are not going to know the proper way to live. And so God directs our steps uh, by giving us instruction through his word. And last week I spoke about our, our response to authority from verses uh, 13 through 16. And we ended with verse 17. And uh, last week, uh, the message was all about how Christians are to respond to government. And I even mentioned how uh, we could expand on verse number 17 and preach an entire message on just that verse, uh, where the Bible says, Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. And uh, that's what I'm going to do tonight. Uh, I closed with that verse last week saying that what a perfect way to sum up everything that he said in the, in, in the first few verses there, or in verses 13 through 16. And, uh, but I'm going to go through, and we're just going to look at this one verse tonight and, uh, and just expound on that for a little while. Uh, and and we're gonna, what we're going to do tonight, we're going to look at the subject of our relationship in associations. How are you to respond to the people around you? How are we to act? How are we to, you know, concerning authority? Uh, we talked about uh, submitting to the government uh, last week. And man, by the way, that's, that's not, just to be clear, a uh, we do whatever the government says, uh, however they say it, whenever they say it. No, uh, we have a higher power that we go by. And if that government goes against God, then guess what? We're going with God and not the government. Uh, but now, in other things... The Bible is pretty clear at what it says, and I'm telling you, this is tough stuff to preach because, uh, I mean, I, it's completely opposite of everything that we are in our flesh. Uh, we don't like to submit to anything. We don't like to, um, <coughs> and I mean, I, I, I answered a question the other day. Some, uh, I was asked uh, if uh, more government was the answer, and I said more government is never the answer. Uh, that's just that's just my take on it. But what government we do have, uh, I, I, the Bible says what it says, and so uh, uh, so we're going to keep looking at this tonight and see not only uh, from last week how we're to respond to government. We're going to look at how we are to respond to uh, all types of authority or even just people around us tonight. And so uh, look at the verse again. The Bible says, "Honor all men." Love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Now, because every human being is value to God or has value to God. Uh, thank you, buddy. <clears throat> I'm dying up here. I appreciate that. <clears throat> uh, because every human being has value to God, every human being should be valuable to us as Christians. God did not create certain people better than others. Regardless of background, skin color, economic status, or ability, we were all created or we were all made by God and we should strive for harmony among ourselves. Acts chapter 17 verse 26 says, And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Uh, I want you to understand tonight that the concept of race is nothing but a social construct. Um, as a matter of fact, what do I mean by that? A social construct? It is a constructed idea. Society created racism. Let me just put it that way. And uh, why do I say that? Because the concept of race is not found in the Bible. It's not a biblical concept. In the culture of Paul's day, the Greeks thought they were a master race and all others were barbarians to them. And uh, it's amazing. We've seen groups come and go that thought they were a better race than anyone else. Uh, you think about Hitler and what all he did. He, he uh, said the Germans were the, were the uh, best race or the, the highest race on the totem pole and the Jews were at the very bottom, which is why the Jews needed to be cleansed from society. 
Uh, you think about the Aryan Brotherhood or the uh, KKK, and, and uh, uh, <laughs> I, this is the South we're in. There's plenty of good racists around here. I ain't getting no amens tonight. <laughs> I didn't say it'd be popular. These are tough passages to preach through. Uh, there's always been people that think they are better than everybody else. That's where it comes from. That's the constructed idea of racism. It all comes from you thinking you're better than everybody else. I'm not meaning y'all, but I'm just saying a group of people thinking they are better than everybody else. And so, uh, but here's the thing. You want to know what the Bible teaches? The Bible tells us that all races have a common origin and all trace their descent back to Adam. It all started with one man and one woman. And everything came from there. Oh, wow, preacher, how did we get this? And I can... Ex Given enough time, we can explain all of that, but that's not the message tonight. I may look at that some other time. But with, all the, with this in mind, I, I want to talk about associations tonight. How we are to relate to those people around us. What, the, what does the Bible tell us as Christians? We are to treat the people around us, or how are our associations uh, ought to be tonight? Now, obviously... Some relationships are more general, while others take on greater significance. Thus, Peter gives some straightforward advice. He starts out in verse 17 by saying, honor all men. Uh, in, in other words, number one tonight, we are to respect all. Respect all. That's literally what the first part of verse 17 means, honor all men. Every Christian is commanded to give honor to all people. God saw fit to love the entire world and make salvation available to all. Amen? Thus, we should value the lives of all human beings. The word honor means to prize. For example, fix a valuation upon by implication, to revere, to honor, to value. We are commanded to value every person because every person in this world was made, guess what? In the image and likeness of God Almighty. Amen. He created them. He loves them. He sent Jesus to die on the cross for them. And we are to honor them as a valued person. All life is valuable. That is something that the devil is working in our society to chip away at like he's never done anything else. I'm going to tell you what starts as children today, as, as uh, I don't know if you've picked up on all of this, but uh, in, in order to make it less sensitive, we no longer, the uh, society as a whole doesn't, doesn't see that little baby as being a human being. They want to call it a clump of cells, or they want to, they, they want to take the humanity out of it in, 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 in way to desensitize. Well, I'm not killing a person. I'm, I'm, killing, I'm, just, I'm just making a clump of cells disappear. Uh, the Bible says that life begins at conception. If you take that life, you're guilty of murder. But see, that doesn't sound good, does it? And so our society's working real hard. I'm going to tell you something. It won't be long. If, if, if the Lord don't come back and things don't change, it starts by, uh, and, and you know, let me just say this, and i got to move on, but um, why does it really surprise us? We have a world, we have a society in America that's been taught for years that we come from a clump of cells. That we evolved from some sort of primordial goo. And, and we were not created. We, we are here by chance. And we are here by just happen, happenstance. I mean, does it really surprise us that we've gotten to this point now? The world's done such a good, uh, they've done such a good job at making humans not very human. Now, now our society can't even tell what a woman is. They can't tell what a man is. 
You know what all of this is doing? It is dehumanizing. I, I saw a movie last week, and it's one of the best movies I've watched in a long time. And it was a dialogue between a psychiatrist and a man that is possessed by a demon. It's, it, it, it was pretty great. It was pretty good. I picked up one quote from this man that is supposedly possessed with a demon. He said this, and I mean, I, I just I can't get away from it. It just makes so much sense. He's explaining to this guy how demons work and how Satan works, and he, he tells him, he says, he says uh, you were made in the image of our enemy, or they call him the enemy. Of course, he's talking about God. He said, you were made in the image of the enemy. And ever since you were made in that image, we have been working to make you into our image. It makes a lot of sense. This society has run amok with dehumanizing people. It's ridiculous. And you mark my words. I'm not a prophet, by the way. But you mark my words. It will not be long before... We start, we move from abortion. Abortion is just going to be accepted. It's just going to be another thing. And, and then, you know what's going to happen? They're going to, they're going to move forward to euthanasia. And then they'll move forward to, well, you're, you're no longer, you're, you are no longer uh, worthy or valuable to our society, uh, so we're just going to get rid of you. And for those who may think that I'm crazy thinking that way, um, as an 80-year-old or a 70-year-old or a 65-year-old, you go ahead and find out that you need a kidney transplant or a heart transplant and see who gets it. It's already happening. And so so I'm telling you, it's... But what does the Bible say? The Bible says, honor all men. We're all made in the likeness of God, in the image of God. We all have value. And this is something that Satan is working overtime to to steal from how we view other people. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He loves all men. He sent His Son to die for them. And we are to honor all men according to the Bible. This means we are to have a respect for all men, considering them to be valuable and important. This was important because the 60,000 slaves in the Roman Empire were not considered to be important at all. God said they were important and should be treated that way. But let me tell you, people are not to be treated as things or just a number. They are people. We've seen this happen for years and years. You've seen all these child stars grow up in Hollywood or grow up in the music industry and all they've... I mean, it it saddens me to read about the childhood of people like Michael Jackson or Macaulay Culkin or or these uh, many other child stars because you know what they were? They, They were just a tool used by their parents to make millions and millions of dollars. No wonder... So many of them turn out the way that they do. Their own parents don't even respect them or honor them. Romans 12.10 says this, Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. Now going back to what I closed the message with last week, while the church isn't to look down on anyone, some people, now just to be clear, live in such a way that we cannot honor their lifestyles. And I mentioned that last week. I talked about that last week. We are not to honor their practice. But they are a human being. If we don't value every person, then we will look down on them. We'll not stoop down to help them. We'll set ourselves above them and we will dishonor God by doing so. Man always gets into trouble when he tries to play the role of the creator instead of the creature. The lust for power over others is the cause of many problems in our world today. What does the golden rule say? The golden rule says do unto others as you would have them do unto you. 
Society would be wise to consider that and live by such a principle. So we find in the Bible we are to respect all men, but secondly, we are to rejoice in assembly. Look at the second part of the verse. It says, love the brotherhood. What's this talking about? It's talking about the brotherhood or sisterhood. <laughs> However you want to look at it. It's talking about uh, saved people. It's talking about the church. It's talking about the body of believers. You know, while we are to treat everyone properly because they are made in the image of God, we have a particular responsibility toward those who are saved. Why? Because we are family. We are a brotherhood. Galatians 6.10 says, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Now the Lord commands that we love one another in the Lord. There was so much hatred toward the church from the world that Peter emphasizes the command that the command and the need for Christians to love one another. We ought to love one another. The world's not going to love us. We've got to have support somewhere. Of course we have support in Christ, but isn't it, isn't it wonderful to know that we've got brothers and sisters in Christ that can support us down here? You know, the local church provides a great opportunity to display the love of Christ. We have a common ground with our fellow believers and should, get, uh, should go out of our way to fellowship with them and assist them through prayer and encouragement and assistance. God blesses those who serve others. Hebrews 6.10 says, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward His name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. You know, it's sad when God's family doesn't get along with one another. You know, whenever you find revival in the Bible, you'll find people in one accord with each other. It's a sign of authentic Christianity. And strife and division are not from above, but according to James chapter 3, verse 15, it is earthly, sensual, devilish. We are to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Love should characterize the local church. It should be a place of blessing. It shouldn't be a place of battling. Psalm 133, 1 tells us, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. So we are to respect all men. We are to rejoice in assembly. And thirdly tonight, we are to reverence the Almighty. Reverence the Almighty. Look at the third part of the verse. Verse 17, it says, Fear God. This is interesting in context. You think about who Peter is writing to here. When you think about who this letter is sent to, Peter is telling Christians to fear God. You'd think that'd be a given. But it's not. The use of fear in the Bible often indicates awe or reverence, by the way. To fear God is to express loyalty to Him and faithfulness to His covenant those who fear God exhibit trust in Him and obedience to His commandments. Not because they are afraid of Him, but because they know who God is. And they know who they are. As a matter of fact, one of the best illustrations, I was watching a Q&A in a church or question and answer session where several theologians and some pastors, some preachers, some teachers, they were all up on the... Uh, the platform, and they were answering questions in this church. And, and uh, one of the men that were there, R.C. Sproul, he was, he was uh, answering a question. Somebody gave him this question to answer. It said, since God is slow to anger, this was the question. By the way, coming from somebody in the church that is a Christian. Here was their question. Since God is slow to anger and patient, and patient, then why, when man first sinned, was his wrath and punishment so severe and long-lasting? That's just, that's a bad question. That is, I pondered that, and I think I would have responded close to the way that R.C. Sproul did. Here's what he said. He repeated the question, since God is slow to anger and patient. 
then why when man first sinned was God's wrath and punishment so severe and long-lasting? Here's what R.C. Sproul said. He said, This creature from the dirt defied the everlasting holy God. After that God had said, The day that you shall eat of it, you shall surely die. And instead of dying instantly that day, he lived another day. And he was clothed in his nakedness by pure grace and had the consequences of a curse applied for quite some time. But the worst part of the curse would come upon the one who seduced him, whose head would be crushed by the seed of the woman. And you're asking me why the punishment was so severe? He paused for a second and got really riled up and he said, What is wrong with you people? What's wrong with you people? Talking, I mean, because it, I mean, it came, the question came from somebody in the audience. He said, This tells me everything that is wrong with the Christian church today. We don't know who God is, and we don't know who we are. He said, The right question to ask would be why wasn't the punishment infinitely more severe? If we have any understanding of our sin and any understanding of who God is, that is the question. The Bible tells us we are to reverence the Almighty. But we live in a world, even even today, when the church doesn't reverence the Almighty. People who are Christian don't fully understand who God is. And they don't understand who they are. And we know that, we know by living that it's easy to lose focus on the Lord and fear for the Lord. We live by faith and not by sight, and yet our faith should encompass a reverential fear of God. A lot of times, it's meant to be a slur, and a lot of times you'll find an atheist. I've seen this on on social media, Fox 8 or WXR. Somebody may may show a tragic uh, death or, or maybe an accident where a family was killed, and people will start saying, I'm praying for you, I'm so sorry. Uh, prayers for the family. And then there's always some kind of troll that comes along, and... and obviously atheist, and they'll respond to those people by saying, yeah, sure, pray to your sky daddy and see what he does. The sad thing is, is many people in the church, while that's meant to be a a slur to who we worship and we serve, and, and, and but unfortunately, many in the church think just that. They think he's, he's just a... Just a nice sweet old man sitting up there that gives us anything that we want. That's his job. There's no reverence in any of that. He's the almighty God of the universe. We are to fear him, the Bible says. He's our eternal king. And we will stand before him one day. So we ought to live each day in the fear of the Lord. Our reverence toward Him should change our motives. It should change our actions. It should change how we live. Proverbs 24, 21 says, My son, fear thou the Lord and the King. Proverbs 1, 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It's the simple fact of life that we will never reverence men until we reverence God. It's only when God is given His proper place at the center of our lives that all other things take their proper place. And if He is not in His proper place in the center, then nothing else will be in the right place. This has gone on for all time. People put their children in top spot. People put their jobs in top spot. People put their ministry as number one. People put friends and family as number one. The problem is, 
It's just like an old bicycle tire or a car tire or a wheel that's going on something. The center of that has to be God or you will not go anywhere. If you put family in that center, you're going to mess up. If you put your child in that center, it's, it's going to mess up. If you put your husband or your wife in the center, and I'm not saying that none of those things are important. They are, but when they are, when they are taking top spot, everything will be messed up. It's only when God is at the center of everything that everything else will be right. Oh, that people would realize that. We are to respect all men, we're to rejoice in assembly, we're to reverence the Almighty, and then lastly, we are to recognize authority. The Bible says, honor the king, lowercase k, lowercase k there. I'm not going to spend long here since last week's entire sermon was about that. But I will say God has placed authority in our lives for a reason, And responding properly to that authority is a proper response to God. Our human sinful nature wants to be in control of everything, but there is great safety and protection in submitting to the authorities in our lives. That submission starts with God, but it includes our parents, our pastor, the government, our employer. The list goes on and on. 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2 says this, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, lowercase k, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. We are not to revere the earthly king in the same way that we revere the eternal king. We are to worship and praise and serve the eternal king, but we are to value and respect and revere the earthly king. So the Bible tells us. That king, that person, I, I just use it like this. When you walk into a court of law, that judge is the authority in that room. And you should treat him as such. And people today have no respect. People today have no Uh, They have no concept of respect. They'll come into a courtroom, look in any old way that they want to. They'll come in and look like they just crawled out of bed. And they'll say, "Uh uh-huh, no, nope, yep, sure. No. That ain't how it works. Unless you want to be held in contempt and spend a long time. I mean, you know. I'm telling you, if I'm going to a court, I'm not arguing with the person behind the bench. I'm treating them with as much respect as I can because why? I may not agree with them as a person on everything, but you know what? Their position demands authority. It demands respect. The Bible says we are to give it to them. We are to seek to honor the king or the ruler by the way we live, we ought not give authorities a hard time. I've told people this before. We, we live in a society they want to get rid of police. The police has got one of the hardest jobs. You look at everything, and I know there's bad cops, but they ain't all bad. There's bad preachers, they ain't all bad. I, I heard a man... I got to quit. I heard a man explaining something to an atheist the other day. The atheist kept talking about the reason he didn't believe in God is because he grew up this way and this person did this and this person did that and that church treated him this way and he has no use for God. This man said one of the smartest things I ever heard. I just loved it. He said, let me ask you something. He said... He said, if a man walks on stage and plays Beethoven and plays it poorly, do you get mad at that man or did you get mad at Beethoven? He said, you wouldn't get mad at Beethoven. Beethoven wrote the song. He wrote the song beautiful. He performed the song beautifully. He wrote it beautifully. And uh, no, you would get mad at the guy performing it because he did such a lousy job. He said, I'll never understand why people get mad at God 
when people portray or, so to speak, play what God has written and do a bad job of it. I've often heard people talk about Walmart and McDonald's, and no matter how many times McDonald's gets your order wrong, you'll go back if you get hungry enough. I saw that the other day. It said, it said, you'll go back to McDonald's for the food if you get hungry enough. The problem is people say they don't want to go to church, and uh, the problem is they're not hungry enough to go to church. But it makes sense, does it not? Why is it when a pastor portrays a godly life poorly, everybody gets mad at God? They ought to get mad at the pastor for playing such a horrible role. God wrote the book. God told us how to act. So it's up to us to do it properly. It's up to us to read the directions. It's up to us to be Christ-like. And so in verse 17, Peter instructs the church to honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. Now the purpose of God's plan is revealed to us and demonstrated by us as we live godly lives before a watching world. So tonight, are we demonstrating godly lives by our conduct in the world and to the world? Do we honor all people? It's sad. I, I have talked about certain preachers and, and, and I, I've been in the presence of other people and said, you know, oh yeah, you ever heard that message? Man, that message is awesome. I really enjoy listening to this guy preach. I don't really know him personally. I did that one time. A guy looked at me and he said, yeah, he might be a good preacher, but you know he's as, as racist as they come. I thought, yeah, okay. No, didn't know that. So what happens? Well, it doesn't matter what he preaches on. That person I was talking to knows something about that man. His testimony's ruined with him. Why? If it's true, he's not honoring all people. And I say if it's true because I don't know if it's true. Particular fellers gone and in heaven, as far as I know. So he can't talk about it now. But I've heard that from other people. I've heard that from people. I've heard, I've heard different things about, sir. Oh, oh, you, you know, uh, oh, that's where they go to church. I'm not going there. It goes back to the whole Beethoven thing. But the fact of the matter is the world's watching us, whether we like it or not. They can tell if we honor all men. They can tell if we fear God. They can tell if we love the brotherhood. And they can tell if we honor the king. And we saw something over the past few years that showed me that there's a whole lot of Christians that don't honor the king. <sighs> Brother Raymond, I need that shovel I talked to you about Sunday. <laughs> I'm not saying I necessarily disagree with everything that was said about the last election and everything else, but we as Christians better be careful because the world is watching how we behave. And they ought to see something different. They shouldn't see hate in us. They shouldn't hear hate coming from our mouths. Do we honor all people? Do we love the brotherhood? Do we fear the Lord? And do we honor the earthly king? Let's stand and bow our heads, close our eyes tonight. Think about those things tonight. If you need some help, this altar is open. Not very fun passages to preach, but this is the Word of God.